Um, let me just again give a brief introduction to both of our guests tonight. We're so fortunate to have John Lennox and Peter Atkins with us tonight. Uh, John Lennox, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics and Philosophy of Science at the University of Oxford. He's a well-known Christian speaker and author. His most recent book is also the title of our discussion tonight, Can Science Explain Everything? Peter Atkins is Emeritus Professor of Physical Chemistry at the University of Oxford. He's well known as an atheist speaker and he's also authored many books, including his most recent title, which was Conjuring the Universe, in which he argues that the universe and the science behind it can be explained in purely naturalistic terms. So we're going to have an interesting conversation tonight as we ask, have the advances in science and our knowledge of the universe brought us to the point where we can say confidently, yes, science explains everything? Or is there something about ourselves and our place in the universe that needs different kinds of explanations about why we're here and what it means to be human? So I'm really looking forward to tonight's conversation. Uh, John and Peter, thank you very much for joining me. Well, we have a question under discussion tonight, and it seems appropriate to begin by asking you both the question, can science explain everything? Perhaps we could start with you, Peter. Yeah, well, I'm not a politician, so I'll give you a straight answer. <laughs> um, the answer is yes. Um, of course, it hasn't yet explained everything, but there are no signs that it's going to run up against a brick wall and stop explaining everything. And I think we should first of all be clear what we mean by science, and science is basically, basically a, a method of, of, of discovery based on observation uh, and taking evidence, evidence that can be uh, shared publicly and generally. And that is really the, the core of the scientific method. But it's not the only component of the scientific method that's important. Uh, because the ideas that science generates set, sit in a, a network of ideas. So ideas might emerge from biology, they might emerge from physics, chemistry, whatever, psychology. And where they overlap, they are mutually supportive. And this is extraordinarily strong evidence for the appropriateness of science as a means of discovering the truth about the fabric of reality and indeed all there is. The second part of this, these introductory comments that I'd like to make is that we have to think about what we mean by um, the questions that science approaches. And I think there are two classes of question. One is stupid questions and the other is real questions. And a lot of the stupid questions, maybe that's too strong a term, a lot, a lot of class one, let me call it, um, questions have emerged um, as extrapolations of human angst, um, worries about the nature of the world, um, projections of, of human ideas where they do not where they are not supported by any evidence. Science deals with real questions. Science deals with questions for which there is evidence. So um, whereas a, a, a typical religious question might be, um, what is the purpose of the universe? Science can dismiss that as an irrelevant question. There is no evidence that there is any purpose in the universe. In fact, I think it rather wonderful that this extraordinary collection of galaxies is just hanging there, totally without any purpose whatsoever. I think that's rather grand, frankly, and rather, rather inspiring. So when you ask questions for which there is no evidence, such as that one, um, you know, what is the purpose of the universe, what is the nature of the afterlife, and all that sort of thing. Um, science need not trouble to try to answer them, because they're nonsense questions. Science deals with real questions, questions for which there is evidence. And some of these are very deep, and let's not hide them under a bushel. I think 
Um, you know, one major question is, why is there something rather than nothing? It certainly seems as though there is something. And we presume that before there was something, there was nothing. So it seems to be a real question. And science has as its objective an attempt to answer that kind of question. Um, another deep question, of course, is the nature of consciousness and all the attributes of consciousness. We appear to have consciousness. There is evidence that we do. And so it is appropriate for science to tackle that. And by consciousness, I mean you know, all the attributes of consciousness, including morality. Um, and so those are real questions. Those are, the science, those are the questions that science can answer. And there is no doubt in my mind that over the past, let's say, 300 years, that science has done its job seriously, that is, collecting evidence, setting it in a network of concepts, uh, and seeing the way that they are mutually supportive. I think there's no doubt that over 300 years we have made extraordinary progress, and there is no reason other than um, pessimism to expect that science will grind to a halt and not answer all the real great questions of existence. Thank you very much. So an emphatic yes to the idea that in principle science can explain everything that's worth explaining in that sense. So John, same question to you. Can science explain everything? Well obviously not. <laughs> Brexit for example. <laughs> that's a a comical response, but I have actually two more answers to the question. You're going to be surprised at how much I agree with Peter, because the definition of science he offered us, that is collecting evidence, making observations, in fact in his book on being, he reduces it beautifully to making observations and comparing notes. If that's what we mean by science, and it's the old meaning of science before the 19th century, then of course science can explain everything, because the very word explanation means making evidence-based observations and notes. So my short answer is, if we accept Peter's first definition, then I agree with him entirely. Science, by definition, explains everything. But of course, the meaning of the word science has changed in England, but not on the continent. In German, Wissenschaft covers the humanities and the natural sciences. And when people these days say science can explain everything, they're not referring simply to making observations and comparing notes at all. For instance, that would apply to any historical or forensic examination. And my faith as a Christian is based precisely on the kind of scientific reasoning that Peter has set forward to us. The main issue, I think, in discussion today is not whether that kind of evidence-based thinking and observation can come to uh, <clears throat> every conclusion. Let me just say, by the way, that from the Christian perspective, Luke, the writer of the third gospel, tells us that that is exactly what his method was. He consulted people, he made observations, and then he put them together. So we'll call that science one. What is, of course, at stake today is the question, can the natural sciences answer every question? And there I think that that is simply not the case. The Nobel Prize winner Peter Medawar, many, many years ago, he wrote a very interesting book on the limits of science. And he said, we do science a disservice, natural science, if we think it can address any questions. And he, refer, every question, and he referred to the basic questions of Karl Popper, the questions of a child. Where do I come from? Where am I going? What is the meaning of life? Natural science doesn't answer questions like that. And Medawar added it is to religion, philosophy, 
and so on that we must go to answer those questions. I think science is immensely powerful. It is immensely exciting and it uncovers a vast amount about our universe. But I have a problem by going too far. I'm a mathematician and I'm rather interested in logic. And you know, if we say that science can explain everything, or science is the only way to truth, as it's often put, well, that is not a statement of science. It's a statement of belief. And so if it's true, it's false. Maybe it's too early in the evening for logic like that, but there's a huge logical problem. So to sum up my position, science is powerful, its methodologies are extremely important also in the sphere of history, forensic science, and in the sphere of religion. But I'm going to be careful here because Peter is right very often in his critique of superstition, of mythology and nonsense. And science has helped to clear away some of the nonsensical things that sometimes religious people profess. But what really makes me, in one sense, very much in favor of the Christian faith is that from the very start it claims to be evidence-based. And the central piece of evidence is, of course, as you probably know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So I believe in Peter's methodology. I use it all the time. But somehow he feels that a Christian like me doesn't use that methodology within my own Christian faith. Final point, um, I think explanation, can science explain everything? We need to tease out what we mean by the word explanation. For example, the law of gravity doesn't explain gravity. It tells, as Newton realized, it tells us wonderful mathematics that we can calculate the way in which heavy bodies move in relationship to one another. But even when we say science explains, often it doesn't explain comprehensively. And I just want to throw a very simple analogy into this, which I find quite useful. About boiling water, how would you explain boiling water? Well, you can explain it by talking about heat conduction and agitation of molecules of water. You can also say the water is boiling because I'd like a cup of tea. Now, those two explanations are very different. They don't conflict. They complement. One is a scientific explanation, natural scientific, but the other is an explanation in terms of the intention and purposes of an agent. And Peter said quite clearly that science doesn't go in for that kind of purpose, but that doesn't mean that kind of purpose doesn't exist. In fact, people have been enjoying tea for millennia before they knew anything about the theory of heat in physics. So what I want to say is this, the God explanation is different from the science explanation. God no more competes with science as an explanation of the universe than Henry Ford competes with physics as an explanation of the motor car. Okay, thank you. Great, great introductory statements uh, from both of you. I'm sure there's lots you want to respond to there, Peter. Where do you want to begin? Well, there's so much nonsense to hack a word. <laughs> 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 I, this may be the phrase of the evening. Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's go to um, what you called the, um, the core of um, your approach, which is um, the resurrection of Jesus. Never happened. I mean... <laughs> well, that's an assertion, Peter. What about some evidence? Well, what about some evidence that it did happen, other than people who are writing Gospels of 80 years later than the event that they purport to be talking about? No, of course it didn't happen. How could it happen? And science, I think, could even go so far as saying it simply could not happen. When you've got a dead body, it's decaying straight away. There's no way that it's going to reconstitute in some way. It's absurd, and or, I, I accept that it is the foundation of Christian faith. That doesn't mean to say that it's true. 
Um, and so I, I, let, let's dismiss that as something that simply has no evidence whatsoever well, of any credible Before we nature. dismiss it, let's hear a response from John, because obviously this is a, an important issue. What, yeah. what counts as evidence so, and, um, and what yeah, are the and, assumptions and indeed, we make? You know, um, can it, I suppose you would argue that science can, cannot explain the resurrection. Well, let's I hear. wouldn't quite argue that way. I would say that science cannot forbid a resurrection. Because you see, science proceeds on discovering the regularities to which nature works and has done a very impressive job. And the fact that we know that dead bodies don't normally rise, uh, that is a law of nature in that sense, means that we recognize something very special happened, if it did happen. Now there are two issues here. The first of all, there's the in principle one, which always ends up in talking about David Hume, who said that miracles are violations of the laws of nature. And I do not believe they are. That's point number one, and I can go into that if you like. Do you want well, me to? Do you want to believe? Well, we might as well, since you Yes, well, you've got to define a miracle. I, I think a miracle is defined as something that is against the laws of nature. Ah, but I don't define it like that at all. A miracle, Miraculum in Latin simply means something to be wondered at, but we're talking about something supernatural. Now, it, it seems to me very clear that when Hume said miracles violate the laws of nature, he was really not understanding. And the great interpreter, Anthony Flew, of David oh, Hume. No. Sorry? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> What's, what? well, well, he, yeah. I think he was going to object to the raising yeah. of Anthony Flew. Oh, well, I'll not raise Anthony Let's Flew. Let's get back to raising He Jesus. has died yeah. and hasn't risen. I do, <laughs> I, I, I do see that point. But the point is this. Um, C.S. Lewis long ago told a, a little analogy. If I stay in a hotel tonight, put £100 in a drawer, and do the same tomorrow night, there are £200 in it. One plus one equals two. If on the third morning I find 50 quid, what do I say, that the laws of arithmetic have been broken or the laws of England? Clearly, I say the laws of England have been broken. How do I know? Because the laws of arithmetic have not been broken. It's our recognizing of what normally happens that helps us to see an exception. Now, if I were claiming that the body of Jesus rose from the dead by processes, natural processes going on in the grave five minutes before we happened. Yes, that would be wrong. But I'm not claiming that. What Christians claim is that the God that created the universe and built the regularities pure into it is capable... It's pure speculation. Well, Wait a minute. Have, no, this, is, not worth this isn't speculation. Well, 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 let's listen and then you respond. Peter. <laughs> Peter, it's dead easy to say it's not worth listening to. You tempt me to say that about some of the things you say, but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> because it seems to me it's very important to listen to what Christianity claims before you judge it. And what is claimed is the God who creates the universe and sustains it is not subject to laws as if they were laws of a land. He set up the regularities and he can feed a new event into them. And the claim is, and with this I finish, that God raised Christ from the dead by an input of colossal power. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Well, you've got it, Peter, in one. <laughs> no, I mean, this well, is... Well, that, that is the claim <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, this is... You, everyone knows here that's nonsense. Um, you're, what you're inventing is an agent who can do anything he likes, he or she likes, I suppose you have to say these days. Um, um, and, and so you're... It is the laziest way of accounting for observations, sometimes observations of, that were never actually made. Um, religious explanations which resort to God did it are intellectually lazy. I won't use a, a stronger term than that, but I do think that they are lazy because, I mean, what does it mean as an explanation? You lie there saying, oh, God did it. And every man said, oh, I understand now. Religious explanations are easy to accept by the unthinking. 
science is difficult to accept because it involves a lot of thought. You really have to tease out the processes by which an event occurs. You can't simply say, and God did it. You've got to go through, in biology, you, you, you delve down into, if you like, the, the chemistry of the, of the organism. In chemistry, you delve down into the physics of the underlying processes. And, I accept, maybe in physics, you have to delve down into the underlying mathematical fabric of whatever I mean by that. Um, it's jolly hard work, and you've got to work on it. But it's more satisfying when you get to the end of an explanation than that extraordinarily lazy way of pretending to explain by saying, and abracadabra, God did it. I mean, that, that is intellectually corrupt. OK. But, Peter, that's confusing two different kinds of explanations. Yes, indeed. If you were to say about a motor car, Henry Ford did it, and that's all you had to say, then I would agree with you. But the point is, as I sit here and read your books and explaining chemistry and all this kind of thing, I say, this is wonderful. This is not contradicting the God explanation, because the God explanation is saying that you, as a chemist, only have a universe to study because God created it in the first place. But, but, but he's not competing. In fact, interestingly, and this has always been a bit of a mandate for me, the very early chapters of Genesis, God commands human beings to name the animals. He starts off taxonomy, which is the basic intellectual discipline. In other words, he said, you go and do science, and you'll find it utterly fascinating. So I think you're arguing at a straw god, and not a straw man can, there. Can I, can I, you, 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 you don't know whether God was starting off um, science. He might have got so bored with his creation that he wanted to amuse them. In some well, who's way. speculating now? Yeah, I am. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think any speculation that uses the word God is intellectually corrupt. I mean, but this he, is absurd. There is, there is no God. Can, can I, there, I mean, well, the, no, no, be quiet. There, <laughs> there, uh, the, there is not one jot of evidence for God. Oh, I only, think there's only a lot in of lazy evidence minds for is God. there evidence for God. Okay, so, yeah. so let me just, to summarise, yes, lazy, corrupt, and, and any, any mention of God is simply going down that path. Why, why for you is that not the kind of lazy, corrupt explanations you're well, talking Well, first about? of all, take science itself. Why am I passionate about science? Why do I believe science can be done? Well, because I believe that in some way the human mind in here has access to the natural world out there. Now, why do I believe that? And sometimes I ask my atheist friends, I've never asked Peter this, but, uh, so he's excused, but I have asked many of them. I, I said, what do you do science with? And they say my, and they're about to say mind, when they realize it's not politically correct to say mind. They say my brain. And I say, tell me about your brain. And one man who's rather famous, he said to me, do you want the really short answer? I said, sure. My brain's the end product of a mindless, unguided process. So I looked at him and smiled and said, and you trust it. And then I asked this question, which I've asked many times. Suppose you knew your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process. Would you trust it? And I've always had the answer, no. And then I say, I see you have a problem. In other words, your atheist materialist stance undermines my trust in the rationality I need to do science. Now, if you flip the coin, Modern science exploded in the 16th and 17th centuries, and its pioneers, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Clark Maxwell, and so on, were all believers in God, most of them Christian. And the point is, it was their belief in God that didn't hinder their science. It was the motor that drove it. So for two reasons. One, the legitimizing of doing science at all is one of the reasons I believe in God. God, as an explanation, makes more 
sense, it has explanatory power, the atheist explanation, as even some atheists like Thomas Nagel these days are beginning to see, undermines confidence and rationality. So John's argument essentially then, Peter, that the very fact we can do science points to a rational logic behind the universe and behind our yeah. ability to understand it, that is, is I suppose, fits better with, with the idea of a God yeah, that's what a, I'm a saying. mind, rather than, than the idea that this all is by chance, it's a, it's a random yeah, accident. For, for lazy minds, that's certainly true. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, the trouble is that um, the philosophers um, are pessimists, basically, because they, <laughs> it's their, they get paid to doubt, and they doubt the capacity of human understanding. Um, scientists are optimists. They think that given time, given collaboration, hugely important, they will arrive at explanations that do not require the insertion of words like God. God is no more than a word, frankly, which is used to disguise the inability to comprehend something. So theologians obfuscate. We've heard that in good measure this evening, if I may, may say so. Uh, science, well, while theologians obfuscate, scientists illuminate. And we are showing that somehow or other, through evolution, only through evolution, we have developed brains which are capable of extraordinary understanding. Now, uh, let me, if I can take a moment just to r r wrap a warning around that at the moment. Um, do we have brains that are big enough to understand absolutely everything? And it's a legitimate question. You know, or are we you know, like a dog in a room, which a dog could not understand classical physics, although we humans think we can understand classical physics. But uh, we have to confront the possibility that our brains are not strong enough to understand absolutely everything. And I think we might even be moving towards an agreement there. But there's different kinds of understanding, um, as John was saying, but of a different kind from what John was saying. Take quantum mechanics. You can formulate equations in quantum mechanics and solve them to an extraordinary degree of precision. Uh, but there are aspects of quantum mechanics, like quantum entanglement and so on, which we might never be able to understand because we humans have been brought up in a world of classical events um, on usually. I mean, as we dropped from the trees, we found that the world was largely classical. It's in the 20th century, 21st century, that we've discovered the quantum behavior of this extraordinary kind. Now, it might well be that our brains simply are not equipped to understand the quantum phenomena that we are discovering. But we can still do the equations. We can still solve it to arbitrary precision. I think that means that we, in a sense, have understood the fabric of reality, let's put it that way, even though we can't intuit the, the fabric of reality because our brains are constructed classically and not quantum mechanically. So um, I agree that there, are, there may be limitations to our understanding, but they are understanding of that kind. I have no difficulty with that because the one thing I would never say is uh, quantum mechanics is extremely difficult. I, I don't understand quantum entanglement, therefore God did it. I would never dream of reacting like that because trying to understand quantum entanglement, that is the job of science, that is the job of physics, and you keep going, as you suggest, until you run out of brain power. You see, God answers a different kind of question which spurs science on, it doesn't inhibit it. No, but now, Peter, no, one no, little no, question no. to I, you. I think this is a very important point. 
um, that science is a motivation. Uh, God is a motivation for science. A uh, motivation. A motivation for science. And I think we ought to spend a moment okay. on that. I think it's, God is also a, um, a great motivation for art as well. Yes. Um, uh, wonderful pictures, wonderful music, wonderful literature, all induced by belief in God. But it doesn't mean that the God actually exists. It simply means that you believe that he exists. So I was going to say that your, your, the very book you wrote, the, the, the statement you use at the beginning is, I think, from Bacon, and who was, of course, a believer. Um, yeah, well, and, they all were in those days. So is that what you're saying, that, that in a sense, whatever John says about the religious sort of faith of the pioneers of science, it was just the, the, For, the to, nature of things? To, to them, it was real. And indeed, it did motivate um, uh, their excellent work and I inspiring work in some cases, and, and certainly in the yeah. humanities. But it doesn't mean to say it's true. Of course it, not. No, so uh, <laughs> it, 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 you, don't, you don't... But what's the point you're making then if you're not saying that shows that it's true, oh, John? The point is it doesn't show it's false. And your little comment there was they all believed in God in those days is also false. Because it's very interesting when you think of the rise of modern science in Western Europe. I've mentioned that. But uh, it was Richard Dawkins put this to me years ago in one of our debates. And I made the point which I now make. Everybody didn't believe in God in those days. The Chinese didn't. And there was very interesting research done by Joseph Needham in Cambridge. He was a brilliant Sinologist, also a chemist, I believe, and he did research and wrote the huge volume, uh, many volumes of the uh, Dictionary of Technological Achievements in China. And he was very puzzled why abstract science of the kind we know did not arise in China. Now, he was a neo Marxist and he tried to explain this on the basis of his atheistic Marxism, but he couldn't. And in the end, he came to a fascinating conclusion. He said, in the end, the difference that, the only difference I can see between the East and the West, they discovered technology, but not science in that sense, is that the East did not have the unifying concept of a single rational creator who created the universe to work in such yeah, laws. But it doesn't mean to say that if you have that having the idea that there is one is not the same as there being one. So, but Peter, uh, that's, it, that's obvious. The, the thing is, it doesn't make it false, but it's part of the cumulative evidence for explanatory power, because in most of these areas, we're making inferences to the best explanation. And an explanation that makes sense to me, that is, that the reason we can do science is the God who created the universe also stands behind the human mind. That makes much more sense than a reason that says we're simply the random product of unguided I, I processes. Want, I want to talk about reasons because you've both brought this up and explanations, different types of, of questions that we ask. Um, Peter, you've said there are sort of nonsense questions that we simply shouldn't be asking because they're not the kind of questions we should be pursuing, like, well, is there a purpose to the universe? Uh, John, from what I can tell, you believe those are valid questions because they are, even if they're of a different nature to the, the, the well, specific scientific questions. Purpose questions and intention questions are among the most important questions we can ask. And I've had a question actually from the audience, which asks, I assume of you, Peter, is it, isn't it a bit too convenient to label questions that science doesn't answer as stupid or not real? Um, well, it seems very sensible to clear the way so that um, you can have a sensible conversation about real questions. Um, but questions why, why is the question of what, <laughs> what are we here for not a real question in your view? Um, because there's no evidence that there is any purpose in the universe. You've got to look for evidence. And uh, as I actually did say right at the beginning, I think, that um, the, the, the real questions are based on evidence. The silly questions, the, the fake questions, if you like, are based on extrapolations of uh, human experience, if you like. You know, so we have purposes. I have a purpose for coming here this evening, although I must confess I forget what it was. <laughs> um, um, 
So you um, believe in purpose, but not ultimate purpose, is that it? Well, I believe that people have individual, temporary, uh, ephemeral purposes. Uh, that's fine. Um, but for there to be a purpose in the universe is an extrapolation of that attitude. Um, there is no evidence that the universe has a purpose at all. So it's inappropriate for science to do a series of experiments to discover the purpose. John. Well, when you say there's no evidence, I would go back to the fact, and I must in that sense come back to my Christian faith. Christianity is not a mere philosophy. It's geared into history. And it seems to me that the whole initial explanation, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, that starts off a huge meta-narrative that gives human beings huge significance as made in the image of God. Now, that may be true or it may be false, but does it make sense? It's not one of these nonsense things. It certainly makes a great deal of sense. And incidentally, some of the brightest minds in history have spent years thinking about these things. I've just read through um, Anthony Kenner's uh, Modern History of Western... Yes. Uh, great thousand-page Yeah, I know. Brick. I've read it too. Um, 900 of those pages show what a waste of time philosophy was when people were worrying about the nature of God and his or her um, the properties. Philosophy, just famous uh, St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, you name them, completely wasted their lives by thinking about non-questions. It's only when... But that's your belief, Peter. It, it, what? Yeah, yeah, but you know, there's no evidence for God is the basis. Of the, it, that's, that's the core of my belief. That's what we're talking about. But is that an assumption the, the, you're, no, you're coming no, no, to no, it no, with, no, no, Peter? No, 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 let me say, the, 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 there is no evidence for God. That is the rock on which I build my um, system of explanations. Your rock is a, a kind of elaboration of that because this physiologically unlikely event of the resurrection um, sort of oh, came into It's it physiologically well. immensely unlikely, yeah. but the evidence of it doesn't stop at the little bit I gave you. You have to think about the whole rise of Christianity from a non-proselyzing People group of Jews. People want explanations. Well, let's allow want, John to give they, at least some explanation, yeah, Peter, and then yeah. we'll, we'll have you respond. The rock in my life is I'm looking for a worldview, and you have a worldview, it's atheism, and I have a worldview that is Christian, that makes sense of life and gives me a meta-narrative big enough to live for and live in. Now, we've been talking tonight, all up to this time, about science and evidence that might come from the natural world. I believe that the natural world with its laws that Peter writes about brilliantly, and I envy him his ability, those very laws are indicators, to my mind, of a divine mind. The fact that at the heart of biology, is the longest word we've ever discovered, the genetic code, is again consistent that this universe is a word-based universe. In the beginning was the word, all things were made by him. So I see evidence of rational intelligence all over science, but I see that the alternative worldview, atheism, undermines that, although it perceives the very same rational intelligence. And so as explanatory power at that level. But you see, I did say Christianity is not merely a philosophy. And if Jesus Christ really rose from the dead, then that opens up huge possibilities of personal encounter in my life now. And the major reason 
why I believe that Christianity is true is because, and here comes science again as a, as a base, because Christianity is testable. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> how, how can it be tested? Well, Peter, let me face that head on. Christ said when he, he was on earth. Didn't, but go ahead. <laughs> Christ said that if a person considered the evidence and came to believe that he was God incarnate, who was dying on a cross to give forgiveness and bring peace with God, well, we can test that. I've tested it, and I've seen hundreds of people test it. I mean, take, take an example. I was lecturing at Harvard a while ago to a couple of thousand of people, and when I'd finished, a young Chinese student stood up, and he said, look at me. So we looked at him, and uh, <laughs> I said, why should we look at you? He was absolutely beaming. He said, you should look at me because six months ago, I came to a lecture you gave at Penn State University. I was at the end. My life was in a complete mess. And something you said triggered a search. And I started to read the New Testament for myself. And I became a Christian. And just look at me now. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen that happen not once, not twice, dozens of times. And when you see addiction to drugs transformed into food on the table, when you see broken relationships mended, and you ask people, what happened to you? And they say, variously, I became a Christian. I had an encounter with Christ. Uh, you begin to put two and two together and, and make four. And I wouldn't sit here for a nanosecond if I didn't believe that these promises that Jesus made actually can be fulfilled in a person's life today. And that's immensely important to me, the testability of Christian relationship with well, God. Well, it's a kind of testability that you should leave to the psychologists and the psychiatrists, I think. But they, I don't mind the psychiatrists. What do you mean, leave it to them? Well, the because they will, they will understand why these people have found the f comfort. Let's, let's accept that it may be comfort. But that in, doesn't in, prove in, it's in, wrong, in, Peter, in, to use your argument. In, the fact that Christianity brings comfort is not, a, is not evidence against it. It may well be evidence for it. If it brought discomfort and ruined people's lives... Oh, it's brought lives, a great deal of discomfort. Ask Joan of Arc, for example. <laughs> You're raising another question, and I'm Irish. I'm very sensitive to that question. And I could go into it if but you one want the, to. One of the points you made was that you... you you're enthralled by the universe and the concept of God because you can see that it provides an explanation of the, of, um, the rationality of, of the universe. That's right. Now, in a book I just published last year, which um, you, you alluded to, um, where I talk about the origin of the laws of nature, which I think is kind of behind your, your, your comfort as it were, well, it might be. Um, I, I, I use four principles to argue, to, to identify the, or, the, laws of, uh, the origin of the laws of nature. One principle is indolence, another is anarchy, and, and uh, another is um, ignorance, and three, three principles. And I can show and I do in that book, that those three principles are enough to account for the laws of nature as we have identified them. I don't need an agent behind it unless that agent is infinitely indolent, is infinitely anarchic, or is infinitely ignorant, which I don't think you would ascribe qualities um, those qualities to a, your God. So I don't need a God to account for this world. We, we obviously don't have time to go into the, the yeah. fullness of, of what you wrote in that book, but the phrase that really st struck me from the book was this, I, you said a, on a few occasions, nothing rolled over into something. That yeah. was the way in which the universe, which is clearly something, came from nothing. Now this yeah. was referenced by you earlier, John. Well, it sounds like nonsense to me. <laughs> and you know, Peter, what do you mean by nothing? 
in that context? I mean the absence of space-time. Or do you mean what we most of us mean, the absence of anything? I, that's what I, I mean, what I said. Okay, <laughs> right. Well, I'm very interested in nothing. In fact, I give lectures on nothing these days. <laughs> yeah. And I had the opportunity to enter a discussion like this in the Harvard MIT Faculty Club. And I was surrounded by the experts, Vilenkin and Alan Guth, the, probably the world's most famous cosmologist. And I did something I never usually do. I said I'd like to ask the first question uh, of Alan Guth, who's the father of the theory of inflation and all this kind of stuff. I had a very friendly discussion. So I said, Alan, look, there's out there, there's much ado about nothing. And uh, I want to ask you a question. When you, as a cosmologist, use the word nothing, do you mean what all the rest of us mean as absence of anything? He said, no, we do not. Well, he was wrong. He should. Uh, because well, <laughs> presumably, if, if, if there was a creation, let's, let's, let's try to talk in your, your kind of language. If, if, if there was a creation, then presumably, the something that we now experience was preceded by the absence of something. And I presume that we can call the absence of something or the absence of anything, nothing. So presumably at the creation, somehow or other, absolutely nothing changed into, I use the term rolled over, changed into something. Is that what by happened? principles of indolence and no. ignorance and no, those come later. Oh, I see. I need to read this. You see, yeah. Peter. I'm yeah. sorry, you but, catch but me out. I th but I think. No, um, let me speak to the no, point. Let me just finish. So presumably, you think that if there was absolutely nothing and it turned into absolutely something, that there was an agent involved in causing that. Is that the creation? I wouldn't quite put it that way. I would, I would say that the universe comes from nothing physical, but it doesn't come from nothing. God is not nothing. In fact, we get the whole thing upside down. We tend to think, partly because of um, the way we're educated in terms of science, that mass energy and material is the basic stuff of the universe. Of course, now we've come down to nothing being the basic stuff. I would want to say about that is, I don't believe it, but secondly, God is not physical. God is spirit. And the fundamental stuff in the universe is mind and spirit. It's oh, not is, material. So then, if I could finish, the universe comes from nothing physical but it doesn't come from nothing. It comes from God who created it. Let there be light, and there was light. And so that is my position. And, and that's not a position which you believe conflicts with the science we do know of, the uh, Big Bang. Not at all. The Big Bang well. is wonderful because it simply tells us there was a beginning. And science caught up from the Bible with the Bible in the 1960s um, because uh, science was tied to Aristotle for centuries believing that there was an eternal universe. Now we believe in a beginning. Whether you mean a beginning of the multiverse or the universe, it doesn't really matter because the latest mathematical theorems by Guth, the man I just mentioned, Vilenkin and Bord say that there is an absolute beginning. So the now, Bible has said it for centuries. Now I think you're willing to grant this idea of an absolute beginning, Peter, but for course, you... Cautiously. Cautiously. I, I mean, it, might, uh, it, it could be that time is circular. Um, and that we're just seeing a few billion years and it looks straight. Um, but I, I'm prepared to accept that that might well have been the beginning. But your view is that prior, well, if you can speak of being prior to, that, that there, there was nothing and the something came from nothing. Obviously, many people will say that sounds like a contradiction in terms. Well, since we've got something and originally there was nothing, then I, th I think it must be true. Right. that nothing turned into something. But what you've got to be very careful about is... It's not a question of nothing turning into something. Is to it's judge. a question of a creator. You Cre see, what science does is to simplify questions till they get to the point that they stand 
open, perhaps, to being answered. And if you look at the universe as a whole, you can see that it actually consists, I think, and I'm prepared to be accepted on this, of equal amounts of opposites. Take, for example, electric charge. We know that there is positive charge in the universe. We know that there is negative charge in the universe. We also know observationally, because of the great strength of the electromagnetic interaction compared to gravity, that if there had been any imbalance, if there were there any imbalance of the positive and negative amounts of electricity, then the universe would blast, be blasted apart and would not have survived until now. So what we've got are positive and negative charges. And what I think happened is that when you have got absolutely nothing, of course, you've got no charge. But at the inception of the universe, it, that nothing separated into opposites, which accounts for why we've got equal amounts of positive and negative charge. And what now, separated I could, I, it? Well, that's the second question. I, and I think you can go on looking at other aspects of the universe, like the amount of energy that there is, and see that when you actually add up all the energy in the universe, it comes to zero. So although it looks as though there's a lot of energy around, in fact, there are equal amounts of opposite kinds of energy. So although I'm not claiming to know how the universe, how, how nothing separated into opposites, what I think it shows is that science has simplified the question. So instead of having to say, where did all the charges come from? Where did all the energy come from? All it's got to do now, and I admit that it has not yet done it, but it seems to me to be a simpler task, is to say, how did that absolutely nothing separate into opposites? Well, let's, I just, let's, I just separated the let's go to a final comment and then we'll go to some questions. Well, I, I would say, Peter, forgive me for being very sceptical here, but I've come across this argument many times. It sounds to me that this is saying something like, because my credits equal my debts, there's nothing going on at all. Yes, I am saying that. Oh, I see. And okay. I think it's a wonderful simplification prior to understanding the greatest question of all, which is why the universe exists. Why, what's your problem with, with putting it in these terms though, John? Well, because these charges, once they are around, are certainly not adding up to nothing. There's a whole system. Now, in my study- no, But they're adding up to zero charge. Oh yes, there's zero charge, but that isn't the only thing around. There's space time around, there's everything else around. Yeah. But what I would like to say is, in my examination of what people believe nothing is, there's Stephen Hawking, there's Lawrence Krauss, and having read all of their books, I discover that the way they get something from nothing, they're not saying you're doing it, Peter, because I need to investigate your book, but is by redefining nothing, which is a very clever cop-out. Lawrence Krauss, on about page five of his book, A Universe from Nothing, says this, because something is physical, nothing must be physical, even if you, especially if you define it as the absence of something. Well, that's sheer nonsense. Yeah, I think that's nonsense. Oh, that's great. Well, we've got yeah. some agreement. Oh, that's is, very good. good. Um, let, let's go to some <laughs> questions. It's been such fun, actually, being in the middle of this conversation. But, um, but we've, we've had a lot of questions texted in, so we really must get to a few of them. What I'll do is I'll give you both an opportunity to respond to each question, well, and, and we'll, we'll try and, we'll try and get to as, as many as we can. What new evidence would be sufficient to lead the speakers to adopt the opposite view? So if I perhaps ask that first of you, Peter, yeah. is, there, is there anything, any kind of evidence that John well, could bring to bear that would actually make you change your mind and I, think I, actually maybe there is a God? I, I, I think that's very interesting. I, I have asked myself that question previously. You know, is there any evidence that would flip me into into the belief camp uh, and so on. And I simply can't think of any. I think uh, if I tell myself that if I agreed with some evidence, then it showed that I'd simply gone mad. Right. Um, so it's a serious question, but I don't think there can be any evidence. Are, are you saying I, your I mean, position is it, unfalsifiable in that sense? Uh, yes, because um, 
even if there was, if I was standing, you know, at the foot of a cross and saw the um, the resurrection before my very eyes, I would put it down to hallucination. It's an extension of the David, uh, it's an extension of the David Hume argument, which you didn't quite complete, because Hume went on to say that there is always more reason to um, b disbelieve the reporter than what he is reporting. Do, do you want to make a comment firstly on, on the fact that for, for Peter there's literally nothing that could convince him that God Well, exists? I'm very interested in what he said at the end, that he would believe it was a hallucination. And he mentioned to me before that the psychologist would work on what I say, but they'd work on what he said. And one of the evidences for the resurrection of Jesus actually is the work psychologists have done in pointing out that it could not have been a hallucination. He was seen by over 500 people at once, different times Come of on. day or night, and all this kind of thing. But there are things that would reverse me. Okay, tell and us what they are. I joined Peter. If uh, you could give me evidence that the gospel writers, for example, like Luke, were not authentic, if you could give me evidence that there's a really convincing explanation that Jesus did not rise from the dead, if you could show me that all the experiences I've had in life with my family and with other people that I would definitively put down to the activity of God, then I'd be prepared to consider. But well, uh, those think... cumulative evidences in my life are so large that I don't think it's likely to happen, but I have to be open to that. Why? Because you see, ladies and gentlemen, because I come from a very religious country, I was accused, and I've been accused tonight of the same thing, of, of course you believe that stuff, you're Irish, is the old Freudian explanation. So what have I done? I spent my entire life opening up my Christian commitment to its opposite is exactly what I'm doing tonight. And I spent my life doing it. A lot of it in Russia, incidentally, where you meet really hard atheism. And doing that, constantly questioning my own position, has confirmed my position. Now, Peter, do you constantly question your own position? Um, or do you see no reason to do that? I see no reason to yes, do Yes, well, that. I see great reason but, to but, do it because, because I don't want to be but, fooled. But I see in you a great, the, an, an example of the power of cultural conditioning <laughs> that takes place during childhood. Well, Peter, I could argue the same. You see, the, yeah. the Freudian argument that says the religion is wish fulfillment, it works brilliantly if there is no God. But you see, I would want to argue that if there is a God, Peter's atheism can equally well be explained as wish fulfillment, the desire never to have to encounter God. The Freudian argument doesn't deal with the basic question, is there a God or not? So I, I simply think but I, that... But you see, I want to understand the workings of the world on this side of the grave. So do you, I. You seem to want to understand them on the other side. But why not of both, Peter? Oh, it's a bigger there, universe than because, just this side of the grave. Because there isn't anything on the other side. But that's of the just grave. an assertion. No, it's the lack of evidence. Well, well, let's go to <laughs> another question. This is a very interesting one. Um, I'm a scientist and long-standing atheist, says this person. Taking the challenge as a scientist to follow the evidence where it leads over many years, I have become convinced that there is good evidence to point towards an all-powerful, transcendent, timeless creator. But I cannot square this with how I feel. My instincts, my emotions say it cannot be. It's impossible. Do either of you think it's possible to resolve such a dissonance? How, from each perspective, would you proceed? Um, let's start with, uh, well, I'll start with John. Um, this person says you know, they, this, they, they feel pulled in both directions. This is absolutely intriguing to me. Why? This morning, I had a letter from a very highly educated doctoral uh, a, a person with a doctorate doing very advanced research who asked me exactly the same question. Exactly the same question. Come from atheism, Dawkins type atheism, and now feels terribly pulled and wondering, this feels so strange, how can I resolve it? My attitude to that is take time. Talk 
to other people, other Christians, your friends. Find out what makes them tick. And read as much as you can, full of questions, something like the Gospel of John, and so on and so forth. And I believe eventually one can resolve these questions. But it's clear that many people feel like this. And I think it's wonderful if you get that far. And in one sense, they can be resolved. But the last, uh, well, not necessarily the last step, but with many of these things, what the problem we have, especially in our contemporary culture, is the matter of commitment. You see, skepticism is a wonderful thing. The Greek word means to check out from a distance. And some of you will be checking out partners at a distance. But you know as well as I do, in order to have a meaningful relationship, you have to give up your distance. If you want to get to know me, sooner or later, you'll have to give up your distance and I'll have to give up my distance. But if we're sensible, we'll not do it without evidence. And so it's a question of that greatest commitment of all, as I believe it is, which is, is to Christ. Making that step of commitment is for some people difficult, but it's in the end the only way to test if the thing works. Do you have any advice for this long-standing atheist who says he's feeling suddenly yes. torn? Yes, it's, it's like John's, but has a slightly different thrust. It I is, thought it might. <laughs> it is to hang on to his commitment, but it's to hang on to his commitment to rationality. Oh. I would want him to hang on to his commitment to rationality, of course, too. You, you can't be rational and a Christian. Right. <laughs> Any response, Peter, John? The yes, gloves are off. Yes, Peter, <laughs> Peter. Yes, I have a response. What do you say to a Nobel Prize winning physicist who's a Christian? Grow up. <laughs> well, between 1900 and 2000, 65% of Nobel Prize winners were Christian. Yeah. Can you understand, Peter, how saying that might come across as incredibly arrogant? No. No. Let's go to another question. <laughs> um, uh, this is one I think... I'm, I'm prepared to uh, this is, uh, conflict my... Okay. No, you is, is, go ahead. Here's one for you. I think this is aimed at you, Peter. If there is no purpose, what motivates scientists to do what they do? Well, they've got to get through life somehow. And, Why? Uh, and... Uh, and, and I, th I think getting through life by in, in increasing the depth of your understanding of this glorious world is, to me as an academic, um, a, a wonderful way of f filling in those few decades of um, consciousness. But Peter, that only works for brilliant people like you. I think of the masses of people who haven't got our privileged yeah, no, we're education. Not sentimental now. We're, no, not yeah. factual. No, factual. The yeah. vast majority of people will never get within no, light years of you your understanding you, of the universe. You, with, the Christ, with your Christian background, would delude them into thinking that once they're dead, they're going to be jolly happy uh, because you know, it, it's, life is a trial, it's a test, it's a preparation for death and they're going to have a wonderful time once they're dead. And I think that is such a delusion that it's, 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 it, it's inhumane. But I, can, I agree that it might be sensible in some cases. But if there, there is, is a God, no Peter, you're, you're deluding people in a big way. Huh. Well, you're telling them there is no God, there's no there life isn't. after death, there's no resurrection, there there's no ultimate hope in your atheism. No. Absolutely. I, I know that... You so know, it's what, hopeless, what, ultimately. I, I, have, um, um, uh, I have no hope for life after death, uh, but I do have every hope for enjoying this life while I have the privilege of being alive. Yes, but That's many people hope. don't. And the vast yeah. majority of people, for instance, no, will I, never see justice in this life. Yeah, and no. if death is the end, as you say, they'll never ever see justice. No, I can agree. That if, we're not, if we're no longer talking about the truth, we're talking about <laughs> um, helping people... You believe through. in truth. 
if we're no longer talking about truth, but we're helping people get through often very difficult, challenging lives, then I can see that in some cases religion can be palliative. It can be a great comfort to them. Uh, it's a false comfort, but you know, they don't know that. And, and, and it might just help them get through difficult times. I have no objection to that kind of therapy. But to confuse that with truth is, to me, intellectually inimical. Let's go to another question. Um, maybe you'll start this one off, John. Why would God create atheists? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, he wouldn't create atheists. I mean, God creates human beings in that sense in his image. And Peter says, created in God's image, as I am. God help God. <laughs> and his rationality and his science and all the rest of it is just an example of the marvelous things that God builds into people. People choose to be atheists. You see, it's a worldview. It's a faith system. I believe in God. Christianity is my worldview. Naturalism is Peter's worldview. He believes it. So the real issue is this. What worldview do we believe in? And uh, that's why we have evenings like this, to try to present the evidence on both sides, which we have tried to do, so that you can make up your mind. But to say that God creates atheists is a deterministic belief that I reject and uh, I feel quite strongly about this, that the wonderful thing about the way in which we're made as human beings is God loves us enough to give us real responsibility so that our decisions and our moral choices are full of meaning. If you say God creates Christians or atheists, you end up with a kind of uh, robotic situation where we're simply puppets on a string. And I don't think that accords in any way with the God who reveals himself in Christ. Peter. I think it's talk of gods creates atheists. Talking about God creates atheists. Mm. As, in, as in once people start to look into it, they become atheists? Yeah, they? Well, so they should. Right. And when they see that the evil that belief in God brings into the world. Well, that's, that opens up another interesting question. Um, here, here's one who asks, do you agree that science gives facts and religion gives values. Um, what do you say to that, Peter? Well, I don't know what values are, frankly. Um, they are, I think we're talking about moral values. I assume that's what's meant. And we're, we're talking about the emergence of whether science, and go back to can science explain everything, we go back to the question of whether science can il illuminate um, morality mm. and, uh, and questions of moral behaviour and so on. And I think it can, be, because we behave in ways that are governed by the infrastructure that has emerged through evolution. I mean, it's really um, we who've been on this earth for, say, four billion years or so have evolved into us and we found ways of behaving and we call that our current moral precepts. Right. Um, but we're not just um, red in tooth and claw. I mean, we're also coated in the milk of human kindness in the sense that in quiet moments of contemplation, we can consider the consequences are of our actions. A tiger can't. A man can. And I think it's um, to understand the emergence of morality, we have to think of the infrastructure emerging from eth ethology and, but would you, uh, and would you, evolution. Would you grant the, the question of the fact that religion could be a factor that helps people to develop those moral values, even if you think it's ultimately got a, well, a scientific I, explanation? I, I might be thinking backwards. I, I imagine that, um, I, I, I suspect that quite a lot of what Jesus said or his purports to have been said, were reverse engineered to make him sound like a jolly nice chap. And he probably was quite a jolly nice chap, if in fact he ever existed. Um, so I, I, I think 
you know, the Bible is a kind of collection of, it's a handbook on getting through life. More. Same question, I suppose, then, John, this morality. Firstly, I suppose, responding to Peter, can it simply be accounted for by a sort of evolutionary cooperation produces? I don't think so. I think you can base virtually any kind of morality on theories of evolution. If you take the nature red and tooth and claw view and survival of the fittest, you'll end up in Auschwitz. But I did go beyond that. I said um, it was larded with the milk of human kindness. Yes, well, that comes I, I from was just about to say, I was just about to say, Darwin favoured ants, and if you watch ants, you can get a good argument for altruism and cooperation. You can build any kind of morality on animal behaviour you want. My view is that you cannot get morality from science. Science can comment on it. Science can tell you whether a fetus suffers pain, for example, but it cannot decide the morality of what you do with that fetus. No, but it can understand. And it can understand. And I'm not saying that it can make predictions or anything okay. like that. Uh, but I think it can understand the roots of morality. Well, I'm not sure important. that it can. I think it's much better to understand the roots of morality uh, through scientific investigation, which includes anthropology, um, ethology, and so on, than it is simply to adhere to a collection of folk stories as written in various... Well, all of, this is, all of this is wild speculation, but if I come back to the, the, the question of morality and science, Einstein made the point once, you can speak of the ethical foundations of science, but you cannot speak of the scientific foundations of ethics. Well, Richard, Richard Feynman, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics, points out that the laws of nature uh, don't come along with rules on what we ought to but do with them. But evolution does, and ethology does, psychology does, philosophy does, and all that these are... But saying evolution does is no different from saying God does. It's just putting a label oh, on come, come. a non-explanation. But let me come to this, Peter. You slipped in one or two things which trouble me. And one of them was, if Jesus ever existed. Now, you're interested in science and evidence. I do not know, and I've read most of them, an ancient historian in the world who would question not only the existence of Jesus, but the basic facts of his life and so on. People who study these things, and it worries me, when a person like you says, if he ever existed, well, you should because the evidence is there that he did you exist. You should read more widely than you clearly have done. I mean, there's plenty of scholars who've questioned the historical yes. existence. And if I might say so, Richard Dawkins quoted one of them. Uh, Dawkins does believe that Jesus exists, but he says a good case can be made out that Jesus never existed. And he mentions Professor Wells of London. He didn't tell anybody that this is a professor of German, not an ancient historian. So I'm afraid I have read both atheist ancient historians, Christians, agnostics, all the rest, they are agreed basically on this. So it seems to me that if you're interested on making observations and notes and science in that general sense, then Jesus' existence is scientifically established. It's rationally established by well, historical science. I don't know what percentage I put on that. Maybe 80% true, but I, I don't think 100%. Uh, let, let's talk about a question that relates to this question of morality and science. So someone's asking, can science help us answer how we should use the technology it gives us? Peter, do you want to start us off on that one? Oh, that's, um, uh, that's a tricky question. I mean, that's... Uh, uh, that takes us into the realm of politics and, and so on, um, which, in a sense, I, then I suppose you have to level at me the accusation that here is something that science can't explain. But then I say to myself, well, can I understand politics through scientific investigation? And that's an interesting question. I think you need to know the psychology of the, um, of the politician, if they have any, some clearly don't. Um, you, you have to look at their, their general upbringing and attitudes in a scientific way, maybe a, a statistical way. I think there are 
you can bring to bear the scientific method on to questions about how political how, decisions how we are, should act are, and, and, and emerge. I, I suppose yeah. it's that, that age-old thing that very often people say science can, tell, can build us an atomic bomb, yeah. but it won't tell us whether we should use it. That's something that we, we have to decide, and that's, the moral questions are different to the, yeah. the scientific Surely. aspect. Do you want to comment on that? No, I just think I would have used that analogy when scientists discovered they had this power. They were faced with a huge moral question and it's often been debated. And at the simplest level, science, chemistry, I believe, can tell me that if I put arsenic in my granny's tea, it will give her a pretty rough time. But science, chemistry cannot tell me whether I ought to do it or not to get my hands on her money. So what does tell us? I mean, I, I have a feeling, Peter, you're going to say, but God's, God's not the one to tell us what mm. we should and shouldn't be doing. Well, clearly. Since there isn't a God, he's not the one to tell well, us. This question, I, I believe, my reaction to it is that actually all humans are morally hardwired in some sense. Now, my belief is that this is because they're made in the image of God as moral beings. But if you leave that aside, the fact is that the research has shown that all around the world, if you put moral dilemmas to people, they will come up with more or less the same answers. There's a basic core of morality. You will find the so-called golden rule, do unto others as you would they did to you, in virtually every religion, non-religion, philosophy, and that so on. That doesn't mean to say that God breathed that rule into into his creation. I haven't said that it, yet. It, it, I said leave no. God aside. Yeah, but it what simply, I'm saying it is ethos, there. But through evolution, we have reached that um, but common ground. Peter, I'm not arguing that. All I'm saying is it's there. And uh, the fact is that therefore we make moral decisions, wh whether we're atheists or not. And often those moral decisions will be absolutely identical. Now, my explanation of that is that this is a result of being made in the image of God. But the important thing in the practical sense is that we do seem to have that common core. Otherwise, society would completely collapse. Of course, but my explanation is not that God did it. No, but we, evolution did it. My, my <laughs> explanation is that we all went through um, a, a very similar evolutionary process, which entailed survival, not only of the self, but of the group. But that might be part of it. But, you know, it's very interesting that even an atheist uh, like uh, the man that wrote, oh, he's a, he's a German, very famous, wrote the book Übergänge, Translations, what's his name? Oh, you're oh. asking the wrong person. <laughs> Jürgen Habermas, ah, who's one of the leading atheist intellectuals, when talking about this question, he said, when it comes to basic morality, the source of human rights, the base of our institutions in the West, etc., etc. He says this. Now, he's an atheist writing. He says it comes down to the Judeo-Christian legacy, and then he adds a very interesting codicil. He said everything else is postmodern chatter. So I would go along with that. I think in this country we owe a huge amount to Christianity at this level as well. Yeah, I think I prefer to live in a Christian country than one, um, well, let's say an Islam country, Islamic country, uh, because on the whole, I think you, you lot um, treat our lot um, better. Would we be better off in an atheistic country, though? Oh, by far. Oh, oh by far. Peter, I spend a lot of time in Russia. Yeah. And I've talked to so many Russian intellectuals. I feel that is just a wild statement. You know, many times I've sat with people like Peter in the Academy of Sciences, and they've said this to me. We thought that we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings, and far too late we found out we couldn't. So where do you stand on abortion? What's that got to do with the topic of this evening? <laughs> because it's a moral question. Well, are we going to deal well, with moral we, questions I, I, tonight? I would say that's an interesting question, but we should probably try and 
come back to, we could go on a wild goose chase I think on we that we can one. infer let, the, let, the Well, let, well no, I, think, I think, Peter, I mean, I, I'm not, I wouldn't dodge a question like that, is that obviously there are always exceptional circumstances, but once life has started, if life ultimately comes from God, it's not just a bunch of complex cells. I ask the question, what right have we to stop it? But there, you see, you have the crux of what we're talking about this evening. Because you will base your decision on a non-existent God. I will base my decision on you know, a natural argument, let's call it as loosely as that. And I will go in favour of abortion, and you will go against abortion. But not every atheist shares your view on abortion. I don't care what they think. I know what I think. But anyway, we're not going to solve that because yeah, that is a, a question ground, that's see, much it's, it's a real further question in. about someone who purports to leave a Christian life that will say no to a woman. You may not have an abortion, despite the consequences. Well, I think that's we, we, deeply, we, we, we'll, we'll, I think we're deeply, probably as deeply, deeply evil. I think, and I think it's one of the evils that belief in God inspires. We'll leave that question to one side for the moment. It would let's um, let's just try and sque squeeze in two more before our time runs out. Um, here's one, and I'll just ask for for brief um, statements on these. Would it be fair to suggest that scientific discovery is moving towards or away from the existence of God? Start with you, Peter. Away. Okay. I mean, the more that science progresses, the less it needs supernatural causes. Okay. S succinct, what's your view on this, John? Well, I suspect it's very difficult to look at this statistically because, you know, they did, they asked this question about 80 or 90 years ago. And it was discovered that about 40% of working scientists believe in God. And it shifted by 2% in 70 or 80 years. I think it just varies uh, who you speak to. And at the moment, I sense a greatly increased interest in the whole God question vis-a-vis -vis science because People are increasingly not satisfied with implausible materialistic explanations of life. They are also searching for meaning, particularly university students. And they're certainly not finding much meaning in atheism, apart from the limited kind that Peter has talked about. But trends come and go. When I'm not able to predict it may be that we have to go through a large cycle of going away from God in the West. There are other parts of the world where belief in God is growing rapidly, like China and so on. So speaking globally, we still have a vast yeah. preponderance of people who believe in God over atheists. Well, I think you have to distinguish different types of scientists. I, th I think it's well known that biologists are more in favour of atheism than um, physicists. Um, because in, I think the, answer, the reason for that is that in biology you've got a single rule, you know, natural selection, which really does account for just about everything. Uh, whereas the, um, uh, in, in physics you've got much deeper questions, you know, like you know, where it all comes from, the nature of the fundamental forces, the fundamental particles and so on. Much harder questions. But so, whereas I think biologists are quite content to feel they've got the answer, the physicists a little bit more I've heard cautious. it put that biologists tend to look down at the ground and physicists look up at the sky and perhaps that's the reason why they, 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 they have a different view on reality. Well, I think but mine the... was a more um, <laughs> cogent way of expressing it. Well, I think sure. also there's a differentiation between uh, within physics, the idea of law, where you can say that something must happen as of necessity, whereas in biology you're dealing a lot with natural history, and so you're making inferences to the best explanation, rather than being able to demonstrate that everything happens. And I think often biologists recognize that. But you see, Peter, here again, assertion. 
evolution does everything. It doesn't. It doesn't explain the origin of life. And it has taken no. some biologists a very long time to realize that evolution, whatever it does, can only get going when life has started. Yeah, well, the, well, scientists are not short of ideas about the origin of life when the inorganic rolled over into being... I get the impression they're very short of ideas, and many of them... Not in the least. What they are short of is um, an understanding of the conditions when life emerged. And so you need to understand you need to know what the conditions were to know which of your many theories were, are viable, if any. Well, let's, let's move on to the final question. Um, and actually, there's two that more or less ask the same question, and I think probably it's best for you to begin on this one, John. Uh, someone asks, why does John specifically believe in the Christian God? What about other religions? And another person asks a similar question, how is one to decide between the thousands of faith on offer without the use of a reliable method such as science. So why, why your God and not another one, John, and how do you come to that conclusion in the first place? This sense? is quite a sensitive question, but the only way I can approach it is by Peter's method of rational inquiry. And you see, at one level, let's take the three monotheistic religions. But before I say anything, this is important. You've heard me clearly say, that I believe you, whatever you believe, are made in the image of God and therefore of infinite value. Secondly, you've heard me say that I believe that there's a common element in morality. So when you raise with me the questions of other religions, please understand I'm not criticizing your morality. That is very important. Nor am I criticizing your value. I'm being asked a rational question. On what basis do you choose? So I'll tell you. Here is one level. The three great monotheistic religions, their attitude to the resurrection, forgive me, Peter, if I raise it again, um, is, forgive the pun, it wasn't intended. Um, <laughs> My Jewish friends believe that Jesus died and did not rise. My Muslim friends believe he didn't die. I believe he both died and rose. Those three things cannot be simultaneously historically correct. So we have to do investigations in exactly the same way as we investigate any event in history. We can't repeat it to see what happened but we can make an inference to the best explanation. And all I can say in the short answer is, I've done that investigation many times and come to the conclusion that the Christian explanation is true. But there's a second explanation, and it's this. I often ask myself, traveling around the world as I've done, ask people of different religions what they mean by a religion. And they usually come up with something like, Southampton University, in the following sense. You have an entrance exam into the university and you get in. And then you're on the way or the path and you're being taught by delightful professors. And then you face the final judgment, which is called finals. Do you recognize that? Okay, now on the way, on your path, the professors, however kind they are, cannot guarantee that you're going to get through at the end. Why? Because the basic principle of a university course is merit. Now, many of my friends, when I ask them about religion, including Christianity, they say, that's it. There's a ceremony at the beginning, perhaps performed at a child or an adult. Then you're on the way or the Eightfold Path or whatever it is, the Tao, the teaching. And then you're faced with a final assessment but the teachers, the gurus, and all the rest of them, the priests, cannot guarantee your acceptance of that final judgment. I think I can um, provide... I, just about oh, I, thought, I thought you were finished. No, oh, no, I think John, John hasn't quite hit the punchline uh, yet. I haven't <laughs> hit the punchline. Christianity, if that's what religion is, Christianity is not a religion for a very simple reason. In Christianity, the acceptance comes at the beginning, not the end. Now, I mentioned that briefly on the way through tonight, and this is the spectacular difference that I, as I sit here, I've not reached the final judgment, but I know that I'm accepted. Why? 
because I'm very good. No, 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 because of what Christ has done. And the absolute essence of what it is to be a Christian is that I have trusted him, that what he did on the cross, now this may seem all mystique to you, but let me say what it is, that what he did there means that I can be accepted at the beginning of the journey. That makes a spectacular difference. In fact, you wouldn't if it was a question of marriage. Imagine I propose to a girl and say, look, here's a cookbook. There are rules in it. You keep them pretty well for the next 40 years, and then I'll accept you. Well, she'd throw the book in my face. But that's what many of us think of God. No wonder people give up on religion, in my view. You're finished. Because it, comes, it becomes a slavish trying to merit acceptance when Christ is prepared to give his salvation as a free gift. So I'm not doing this evening, for example, to gain brownie points with God. I'm doing it because God has accepted me, and that is the wonder of Christianity to me. Well, if I can give, help John with a more succinct answer um, to why he is a Christian, it's simply that he was brought up in Ireland. But Peter, that's absurd. That's saying that uh, because you give a genetic origin for me, that explains everything no, I do. No, it's a cultural condition. No, but the point is, Peter, and I've met many Northern Irish atheists as well. There yeah. are very many. There, there are always exceptions. But, but Peter, I have experienced again and again people changing their worldview, which shows it's not culturally dependent. That was no, one of the most important questions for it, me. It shows life. that you are particularly contaminated by <laughs> your, your upbringing. Well, that's very nice of you to say so. <laughs> It's been an interesting evening. Um, we are sort of needing to draw things to yes, a close. Right. Um, are there any final things we'd like to say that we want to sort of uh, round off the evening with before we, before we go our separate ways? Do you want to start, Peter? Mm, well, science is the, the, the way, the truth, and the light. <laughs> I think I've heard that somewhere before. <laughs> and no, I, if I can just enlarge that slightly. Uh, um, we should be proud, as I said, <coughs> said right at the beginning, that somehow or other through collaborative enterprise and open-mindedness and communication and mathematization and observation, we are delving into the workings of the world, into, if you like, the fabric of reality and answering all the great questions of being. We should be proud that we apes who have dropped from the trees have gone so far intellectually. And although I acknowledge that uh, religious belief was a component of that journey, we are breaking out of that chrysalis and taking over the heath. John, final thoughts. Science is wonderful. But the God who gives us a world in which science can be done is even more wonderful. And I'm very thankful that it's not an abstract set of intellectual disciplines, but a person who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. Can we have a round of applause for both our guests?